This is from Matthew Arojas. Uh, okay, Dolphins fan, who admittedly is a Tua doubter, so feel free to let me frame the rest of my question. Should the Dolphins be fielding trade offers from Tua, specifically from Washington? Hear me out. The fact that the deal hasn't gotten done yet is a huge, isn't a huge concern, but it does make me think that Miami's front office is too much in a hurry to go all in on Tua just yet. Perhaps they want to see him stay healthy for a full year again. Maybe it's something else. Who knows? Now, add to the top of this the cap situation Miami is currently in, plus the big contracts they'll have to give out soon, namely Jalen Waddell and Jalen Phillips. So with all that in mind, if Miami were to call Washington today and make an offer to trade up to two and trade away to it, does that seem like a somewhat reasonable idea? It resets the rookie contract clock for Miami, allows McDaniels to get, quote, his guy to build around, also gives Washington's ownership group a, a franchise QB to ring in the new era. Sure, they could do this with a rookie, but they've got the money to extend to it, and Washington's new coach and GM will be sitting much more comfortable with an established guy rather than rolling the dice on a rookie. So I think high level, the question is, at the end of four years of a quarterback, and if he is not in the quote-unquote clear elite category, this dude's not top five necessarily. And I know some two-anon fans would say he is. Mm. He's a top five quarterback, clear as day. If you don't have the top five, the top eight guy, clear as day, is it a viable strategy to not extend them, move on, despite all of the success Miami has had and the fact that Tua has played really good football overall the last couple of years? Really good football. He's been very good. But are, are the Dolphins left wanting, right, maybe the same situation we're going to have with Brock Purdy in two years with the Niners where you're trying to separate the statistical output of the quarterback from the, the play calling <clears throat> and the supporting cast and all the things that Miami has been very good at the last couple of years? Uh, I mean, this is one where it feels like there's a different theoretical answer to a practical answer. Like, I – don't want to dump on the question, but I, they, I think I would just sort of fundamentally reject the premise of like, this is not happening, right? There's no way. They, aside from anything else, Tua is Mike McDaniel's guy. I know that I McDaniel agree. didn't draft him, but McDaniel loves that guy. And he is, more, he is convinced that Tua is the, the guy and can be the guy and can be that top five player. And, you know, statistically, they are able to produce as well as anybody with Tua out there. So you can understand why you would think that. Um, that one of the, the problem is if like you have to be the instigator right nobody's phoning up the dolphin saying hey would Tua be available for trade so as soon as you pick up the phone to washington and say hey would you be interested in trading for tua immediately washington is going well why would they want rid of tua it's like self-defeating in order for you to instigate the conversation you effectively are saying we the team that knows him best does not think he's worth this because we want to get rid of him. So then why would a new team want to take that on board and give him the contract that you don't want to give him? And it, it doesn't, I don't think it works that way. So you end up in this difficult situation where you might want rid of him, but, or you might, you might sort of theoretically be better positioned to get a guy who's comparable and much cheaper. But now you've put yourself in a position where it's difficult to achieve that, right? You're not going to get value for the guy trading him away. So you basically have to let him play out his contract and walk away the way Washington eventually did with Kirk Cousins. But then the guy's probably too good or you're too good with him at quarterback to position yourself for the next guy. So like, let's say Miami wanted to do this right now, right? Somehow they stumbled into a trade offer for him. I mean, they're picking 21 in the draft. And a draft that four quarterbacks might go one, two, three, four. Well, in this situation, they're, they're trading up to two. Assuming they can get two for them. I mean, they wouldn't do it. Let's just, let's play that out, okay? They can get to two, right? They can get your favorite number two quarterback, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy. You can get your favorite guy. I don't see how you... Instead of Tua. Yeah, I mean, I just don't... Why would I mean, if, if Washington was interested in Tua... If they said, sure, we do want that security at the quarterback position. We do have enough cap flexibility. We want Tua to be our guy. If Washington said that, of course, I think I just don't think any of these things align that. ever in a practical sense. If you are out on the guy as the quarterback. Here. Yeah, but the it just doesn't work. The hypothetical doesn't work. If you are out on the guy as the quarterback that can take you to a Super Bowl, there's not a team in the world that's going to give you the number two overall pick for him. Is essentially the point. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think teams are at different parts of their life cycle. I mean, look, I do think all of it's moot because, as you said, Tua is the guy for Mike McDaniels. I, I think Mike McDaniel. 
McDaniel, right? Yes. I can't stand. I I haven't been pluralizing his last name, right? Uh, I don't think I can't stand when people do. <laughs> so if I when I if I caught myself there, I couldn't swear accidentally to it. doing. I can't stand when the when names are pluralized when they don't need to be. Okay. Look, I'll mispronounce your names. Yes, regular. But I will not add an S or remove an S when it's when it's not supposed to be there. Okay. Okay. So anyway, um, that's the interesting thing about Tua in Miami. And I think Brock Purdy in San Francisco is going to be Kyle Shanahan's guy. And then, again, both things are true. I think the actual – if you just look at the stat line for Brock Purdy and Tua Tungavailoa, I believe they're much higher – in part because of the awesome playmakers that they're throwing to and the awesome play callers that they have. What I also believe is true is that Tua's quick mind, quick release, ability to avoid sacks, get to the ball to these playmakers, throw with anticipation, is a great fit for Mike McDaniel's offense. And I believe that Brock Purdy's ability to get through reads, extend plays when needed, run the offense effectively, is a very good fit for Kyle Shanahan. And then I also believe when you're competing with the Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allens and Joe Burrows of the world and Lamar Jacksons of the world, there could be some limitations in those games where maybe you got to take over. You know, Tua in the cold looked awful against Kansas City. And the big games, Tua in big games against better competition has not looked great. I'm not ready to go there necessarily with Purdy yet, but Tua in big games. So there's a conversation where you could say, okay, yeah, we're, 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 we're tapped out. We're, we're top, we're maxed out. With Tua, and now we got to pay him market contract, putting all that pressure on the rest of the roster building. That's that's a challenging place to be. So I think high level would a team that has a Kirk Cousins type of quarterback that level top eight fringe guy. Are they bold enough to move on to the rookie contract quarterback and say actually you could take a step down at quarterback play, but that'll build up the rest of the roster and give us the same chance to win. I don't even so. Pittsburgh is an interesting uh, case study this year in, in how they approach the quarterback position because, okay, it's a very different situation in terms of Kenny Pickett hasn't had a season that looks anything like, you know, high-end Tua or high-end Kirk Cousins. Um, but they are a team that is sort of voluntarily is a pretty good team, you know, is one of these borderline playoff contending teams any given year and has decided we don't really have a realistic shot at a massive upgrade so what if we just get cheaper, right? So instead of this world of, like, I, if, I'm getting, if I'm moving on from Tua, I need to go up to number two in the draft to get the next guy who has the potential to be special, like this concept of chasing special even though you have good. Um, instead of that, what if we recognize that's probably unrealistic and there's only so many Patrick Mahomeses walking the earth and the chances of us stumbling into one, even with the second overall pick, are minimal, what if we instead just get really dirt cheap a quarterback and hope the drop-off isn't that big? That's what they've effectively done this year. They brought in uh, Russell Wilson, who's getting paid nothing because Denver's on the hook for his deal, and Justin Fields, who's not getting paid an awful lot because he's towards the end of his rookie deal. So they've said, we have a pretty good team. We're also picking low down the draft, and nobody's going to give us anything significant for the guy we want to get rid of. So... We don't have, a, we, there's no chance where we come into next season with a superstar. So instead of getting, instead of aiming for like a good guy and paying him a lot of money, let's try and get the cheapest possible viable option and use that. So the that to me thing, is the interesting like counterfactual. What happens if we do that? So the part to make that work is then you have to take every other potential dollar and try to yeah, show put it, it in, something else, put it into the roster. Last thing I'll say on this, and I think I saw, um, we just mentioned Nate Tice a little while ago. I think him and Robert Mays on their The Athletics podcast said something to the effect of recently, that's the GM's job, right? Most GMs aren't saddled with the top five quarterback, right? In fact, 27 of them, 27 of them are. And so the job is to build the team, right? Most GMs are in the seat to just build around whatever you have at quarterback, right? You might be looking for other quarterbacks, but build around whatever it is. And I think most GMs are willing to accept that, right? So Chris Greer in Miami is mo most likely to say, we're familiar with Tua. Do I want to pay him Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes money? No. But whatever, like, whatever Jared Goff gets, 
from the Lions might be a good proxy for Tua, right? Sure. And they could say, look, Jared Goff has been to a Super Bowl and an NFC championship, and you haven't done that yet, but you're younger and you put up similar production. Whatever Goff gets, we'll get we'll give you. And then we'll and then it's my job to figure out the rest, right? So most GMs are likely to do that rather than to play what's in the unknown box. Let me see what's in the, what's what's in the Drake May box, what's in the Jaden Daniels box, just because it's cheaper. Like right? there's a lot of risk. I mean, in that too, we are still in a in a situation where the league's quarterback contracts are far too divorced from the quality of the quarterback. Other positions, I think, are better at this where how good you are at the position relative to everybody else in the NFL is more closely reflected in the contract that you're getting given. You know, like a, a middling yeah. corner is not getting top of the market money just because he signs now. Whereas a middling quarterback can get top of the market money just because he signs right now, right? Kirk Cousins, I mean, he's better than that. But, you know, guys like that can get top of the market money simply by p- playing quarterback to a reasonably decent level and signing at the right time. The NFL still needs a better sliding scale of quarterback money. And it's moved in that direction. I mean, Geno Smith, Baker Mayfield, there are contracts being done that are closer to that. And we're at least sort of probing the edges of this middle-class quarterback contract. But like that's what a team like Miami needs, right? Is is a world where we're not facing, like we're not staring down the barrel of making Tua one of the most highly paid quarterbacks in the NFL, there's a much fairer middle ground here, and that will give us the money that we still need to spend on the roster. I mean, that's what the Niners are in this situation where they at least have a couple more years of Brock Purdy right. eating ramen noodles every night, you know, just trying to survive. But it's also... In his apartment with six other right. teammates so that they could pay the rest of the roster, you know? I mean, the other problem is it's impossible to actually correctly quantify how good those players are, right? Quarterback is so dependent and intertwined with everything else like nobody can agree how good Brock Purdy is right and so my point is for the but so here's the thing that I've come around to for the 49ers does it matter right but that it, it does when you get to the contract so now it doesn't right does it matter whether or not Brock Purdy is a complete does the credit pie right. matter right now exactly yeah. right now it doesn't matter because the whole of the pie adds up to Super Bowl, right? That's the important part for San Francisco right now. When you get to the contract, now the credit pie matters because if Brock Purdy is only a sliver of that pie and you give him the majority of the money, now you're taking away money that needs to go to the other parts of the pie and the whole thing crumbles. And the sum of the pie no longer equals Super Bowl. So right now, it doesn't matter whether or not Brock Purdy is worth none of the pie, all of the pie, or somewhere in the middle. But it does matter as soon as he gets the contract. And that is the problem, is that collectively we are unable to identify how much of the pie is actually the quarterback correctly, right? Right. And that is our real problem when it gets around to contract time is we know that the more money we give the quarterback, the less we have to spend on everything else. We're comfortable that if it's Patrick Mahomes, there's no sum of pie that the quarterback can get that's too much, right? That's why when Joe Flacco, who had won a Super Bowl, is all of a sudden the highest paid quarterback. Right. It's like, well, we know this is incorrect. Right, but we're not confident in how much any other quarterback essentially should get, right? Yeah. Obviously, the very top guys we're happy with, but like once you get beyond that, how much of that, how much contract should Dak Prescott get? Like, even if we just said, let's say there's a world where you, t- you pitch this to his agent and he immediately says yes, right? Let's just say you have a magic wish that Dak Prescott's agent just takes whatever offer you give him. What's the correct sum of money he should get paid for how good he is? There's nobody knows that. None of them. Yeah. It's a challenge. That's the biggest problem in all of this is that we're, we just don't even know how much the guy should get even, even before you try and make that happen.